I think I found the one argument though um, that I think is the most convincing to me. My goal, Destiny, was to make you look stupid. Someone who's never pregnant could have abortions. Mm -hmm. Like that to me seems super, super weird. And we're, we're kind of off field of legal conversation, but just to-, to Yeah, there's gonna, the everything around abortion is gonna seem super weird because it's, it's a very weird question. Like we're really testing like the boundaries of what the f human life is. Correct. The thing that's ridiculous and why I was laughing, why I was dumbfounded was not the policy rationale that you gave. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, there, there's some idiot, uh, I don't wanna say idiot. I wanna be <laughs> yeah, go ahead. There's some, re and I usually don't <laughs> involve myself. You have to be a grade A moron to not see the logical, yo. Well, look who it is. It's Pisco, the fucking loser. <laughs> What's going on? I've had so many fucking lawyers and some, unworthy three L's emailing me like legal shit. I think I found, yeah. I, I found the one argument. Um, also, Jesus, try and understand like substantive due process and all that shit is fucking AIDS, okay? Oh yeah, 100%. Um, I think I found the one argument though um, that I think is the most convincing to me. Um, I don't know if you care to listen or if it matters to you or whatever. Um, it matters to me. It does matter to you, okay. Well, I'd be able, um, I feel like I did a poor job giving my affirmative position previously so after you're done can i can i do that is that cool um yeah if you want to. i don't know if i want to relitigate the whole conversation i um cool. i think and actually it's funny you kind of were making this point unintentionally um i actually think starry diseases is actually paramount i think it's probably the most important thing so i think based on what i've seen i don't think i really like the row or the casey rulings but I think that the concept of a ruling made by the court sticking, especially after say 20, 30, 40 years, is probably important enough that even if you don't like the original ruling, it has to stay. Um, otherwise yeah. you end up in an area where it's totally possible that, and you kind of were giving examples, it's possible that maybe we could go back and look at a whole bunch of different rulings. Like, I don't really know about this. This is actually kind of bullshit too. But do we really want a court that's like in the business of like relitigating every single potential decision it's ever made. Like that seems to be a really messy spot for the court to be in. So I think I think even disagreeing slightly, and I say this slightly because it's such a cluster, but even being like a little bit against the, the Roe and Casey decisions, I think the concept of that precedent set by the court is probably important enough to protect. Yeah, I, to be honest, I think legally that's the stronger argument mm -hmm. so far as the court's considered. Mm -hmm. um, if you listen to the oral argument, and I'm sure with respect to like the chief mm -hmm. and any kind of uh, give that you're, you know, I think that any belief that this is not going to go the way of overturning Roe and Casey at this point is a little bit of a cope. But to the extent that such a hope exists, I think it relies pretty exclusively on star decisis principles. Well, have you, do you, do you have any opinions about who leaked the draft? I, d I, I don't. I, mean, I really don't. I, I've no, heard, I can see both cases. Yeah, I've heard crazy stuff. When I say I've heard, not like I know anything, but like I've heard like just on the internet that initially the, the rumor, well, I think the two things that I've heard is either one, like an activist clerk leaked it because mm -hmm. of whatever. Um, I've heard some people say or, or, or claim that maybe um, Sotomayor themselves leaked it that they were like, fuck it, that she was like, I'm gonna leak this to put pressure on like a more moderate judge to flip their decision. Um, and then I've heard the idea that a conservative justice actually leaked it because he wanted what the current standing was to be like cast in stone so that they don't change their opinion uh, when it comes out. So I've heard yeah. like, every, yeah, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know which of those is more, uh, if I had to guess, uh -huh. to me it's plausible that a conservative would have leaked it just given the fact that tactically it looks like such a mistake mm -hmm. coming from a liberal, um, a more liberal clerk to me it would be such a crazy breach of norms for a justice to have leaked it yeah it almost i almost don't that to me would be that. such I, I don't want to believe that it, it seems like when i listen to any judge talk about being on the court like all of them insist that it is not a political position that they're there and obviously people have their leanings but none of that like they yeah, get um, yeah, there was one that I heard wanted, um, fuck, who was the one that everybody said was supposed to retire, that did retire, I think, under... Breyer? Or, or do you mean that didn't retire under Obama? No, under, um, under Biden. Has anybody retired yet? Breyer. Breyer. Is it is going to retire, and uh, he's, that's why we had, um, Judge Jackson up for nomination. Gotcha. Uh, Breyer's gonna, gonna retire. I don't remember what article I read, or if it was serving him directly. 
or if it was just talking about him and past statements he made. But I read an article that was talking about how like people like Breyer might stay on the court until they fucking die because the concept of doing a political resignation, which is kind of what it is, is like so mm-hmm. fucking irritating to you. Um, so like, yeah, if to, to, go, to hear all of this about all these Supreme Court justices, if one of them leaked it for political purposes, it, it would be such an it's egregious wild. break of norms for such it, a, yeah, it would be horrible. And it's, I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's good. Not, not that I think that the, the bigger story is the draft opinion itself, in my opinion. But I don't think it's a good thing that it leaked. Um, If you're on the pro-choice side, I think you lose a lot of leverage because of the draft coming the way it is. Because now conservatives get to focus on it. And now um, if we don't end up finding out who it is, which that's a possibility that we have to be prepared for um, forever, this will be lurking over it. um, And it will be a specter over this opinion. And potentially there could have been justices who were on the fence. um, But for this opinion now, it would look totally wrong from an institutional perspective to to change quote unquote change their vote Mm -hmm. even though i think it's a bigger breach of norms to overturn roe for the reasons you stated about sorry decisis yeah and that's this is one of the things that is fuck who is it roberts or what like there was some justice that people said might have been like kind of on the middle on this if it's a 5-4 split and that and that the goal of leaking it was to just solidify that opinion because now if it changes now it looks really bad right yeah it looks really bad um yeah so that's kind of my take on the on the leak which i I really don't know Mm -hmm. who it is if if it was a liberal person then i think that it was short-sighted because i think ultimately this kind of leaking schedule hurts the dems and hurts the left and hurts pro-choice yeah Um, i i do want to dive in a little bit on on why tactically why didn't i bring up stare decisis as the first thing Mm -hmm. to talk about when i was speaking with you go for um and i it almost would have been the better argument to bring with you mm-hmm. now thinking about it, because uh, I think that you are someone who has at least said that they care about institutions and norms and stability. Um, but people don't like to hear that. Yeah, People don't like to hear that we're going to maintain incorrect decisions mm-hmm. and that that's something that we should could ever allow. Mm-hmm. And so me starting on that front and and even though I maintain that the central holding of Roe was correctly decided, Mm -hmm. me starting with stare decisis almost feels like an admission that Roe was wrongly decided. And so that's one of the reasons why I I don't start there. Um, But maybe with you, I should have. Sure, I can understand that. You're, uh, I guess so, it's a different in tactics because, I, well, maybe I would say like your goal isn't necessarily to 100% convince me that this particular overturning is right or wrong but more you just kind of wanted to have an argument on the merits of Roe and Casey. Um, this, you're this more is what I want. That conversation. Yeah. Let me, let me, and this is what I'm going to do if there's a future debate mm-hmm. with conservatives. So anyone who's watching this will know my tactics and know <laughs> what, what, what my purpose is. Sure. Um, and it requires you to know a little bit about the kind of rights analysis at the, at the forefront. Um, yeah. When oh. you're dealing, yeah. Before you get into this, actually, can I read something really quick? Sure. <laughs> Jesus. The, Jesus. Okay. Um, oh, actually, that guy that I just dragged in, um, I'm just going to read part of this email that he sent me, and then it'll be the sure. preface to what you're about to explain. Because um, I'm going to be honest, I'm not a lawyer, if you didn't know that, and I, I didn't know the whole construction of this shit. So sure. I'm just reading two paragraphs, <clears throat> and then you can tell me if you disagree with any of this. The degrees yeah. of scrutiny under the 14th Amendment. I believe a really foundational aspect of 14th Amendment that doesn't often get addressed is the, relevant, is the relative standards that courts apply when reviewing laws. I believe this divide is easiest to explain with the Equal Protection Clause because that is largely from where these doctrines stem. For the purposes right. of equal protection, um, jurisprudence, the court has to determine the classification a law makes, who is being treated unequally, and then apply the proper scrutiny, review the means and fit, If a classification is not suspect, for example, a law that applies to lawyers or streamers, the court engages in rational basis scrutiny, which looks for any rational relationship between the law, the means, and a conceivable government interest, the end. Similarly, for a quasi-suspect classification, for example, sex, what? Yeah. yeah, intermediate scrutiny applies, meaning the law must be substantially related to an important government interest. Finally, suspect classifications like race demand strict scrutiny, which means the law must be narrowly tailored to a compelling government interest, a near perfect means and fit for a uh, super important purpose. This strict scrutiny is what applies in the case of a law affecting fundamental rights with some exceptions. And this is why Pisco was constantly telling you to forget about the state interest for now because you were focusing on the right first. While it is true that this two-step process of identifying the right and then identifying the interest for the means and fit is correct, it does not apply 
apply as cleanly to substantive due process as it does in EP context because fundamental rights come with pre-existing strings attached, and those strings overlap significantly with state interests. Um, I think for an example, and then there's another one where he talks about rights um, that are subject to limitations and everything. Yeah, but yeah, the, the whole yeah. construction of these and the testing is like very complicated. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in general, that's 100% correct, and I would absolutely agree that the kind of tiers of scrutiny analysis fits most cleanly in equal protection contexts. Mm -hmm. um, to to give you a little bit of an overview on like how important it is to the the difference in tiers of scrutiny. Um, rational basis review which is the lowest tier of scrutiny mm -hmm. imagine that i were to make a law that said um you know blind people aren't allowed to drive mm -hmm. blind, blind people aren't a suspect classification gotcha. they're not a discrete and insular minority they're not subject to a heightened standard mm -hmm. and what rational basis review tells us is the lowest tier of constitutional scrutiny gotcha where rational it's, basis just means like is there some reason why you would have this law like does a state have an interest in this thing yeah, like, it, yeah. it's not even like look into their actual reasoning mm -hmm. can, can you even is there a conceivable legitimate end of government think about uh, always and uh, the emailer mentioned it too the end and also the means mm -hmm. it's not just you can't just say national security and that ends it mm -hmm. it's also the the way in which the law interacts with the means. Sure. And so what rational basis says is like, all you you don't need a compelling purpose. You don't need an, an important end. You just need a legitimate end of government. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it just needs to reasonably relate to that end of government. It's so loose. And what, what's more is we will even um, hypothesize possible reasons why you might enact that law. That's mm -hmm. how, and the burden of course is on the person. Uh, this is a very important too. The burden of proving that something is um, that fails rational based review is 100% on the person bringing the lawsuit and not on the government. Sure. What does this mean? The only things that are going to be struck down under rational basis review are truly arbitrary and irrational laws. Mm -hmm. Like the most, are, like to fail rational basis review, all that is saying is that you've created the, like a nonsense law with no conceivable correct. Purpose, right? yeah. yeah. Or, or let's say that you're at the end is just an impermissible end. So there's a line of cases where. It's not a suspect classification, but the only end that government has is to like treat some group of people worse. Sure. And that's it's just motivated by animus. And so it's not a quote legitimate end. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people call those cases rational basis with teeth. Um, but for the most part, the rational basis review is going to be extremely, extremely deferential to government interests. Gotcha. Whereas, Real quick, can I ask a question? Um, all of this stuff applies through all the levels of courts, right? This isn't just the Supreme Court reviewing cases. That's correct. It? Okay, gotcha. Okay. Under, yeah. So, so like a federal court or like a, even a smaller or a court. state court. Yeah, could theoretically court, do. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Um, and a, a little bit what's difficult is this kind of formalistic tiers. This is why I was saying before um, when we were referencing Griswold and other cases, mm -hmm. before like uh, the 20th century, it's hard to think of. You, you can see the patterns in the cases, but they don't really conceive of the... Um, the rationales these ways. Mm -hmm. um, Roe v. Wade explicitly will use words like, they won't even say strict scrutiny, they'll say a compelling end, mm -hmm. narrowly tailored. That's the language of strict scrutiny. But nowadays, we will just refer offhand strict scrutiny, rational basis. Yeah, because it um, seems like the court over time, um, like, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I think even for like substantive due process, it wasn't like there was a case where the court said, hey, substantive due process exists. It's like slowly over time, you're kind of like using yeah. language and narrowing out these right. things so that, yeah, like 60 years down the line, someone could be like, okay, now we kind of recognize this as a concept that's been basically constructed by the courts yeah. over time and rulings. Yeah. It, it, exactly. And what's really bad, um, well, before I get into Lochner and that kind of stuff, the uh, let me just talk about tricks for the other end of it. So mm -hmm. on one end of it, you have this rational basis review. And that is going to be applied to like any law, really, because every law conceivably makes some classification sure. of people who are going to follow the law, who mm -hmm. are not going to follow the law, of people who you know want to pillage and murder and those who don't want to pillage and murder. Mm -hmm. uh, but the 14th Amendment gives a, at least a, a bare minimum standard for non-arbitrariness in our laws. Sure. And um, that's a real, that's rational basis. On the other end of the spectrum, you have strict scrutiny and that is the highest level of judicial for the things that because even in so strict scrutiny is going to be something that is like like almost targeting like a protected class like a law right. that only affects like black people or or like veterans yeah. or something sure. so i'll give you an example the affirmative action cases that is a and people disagree with these cases and, and i also predict that this court will overrule or at least will get rid of um the precedent on affirmative action cases so 
you all get ready for that because that's that's coming. Um, but that those are explicit racial classifications by the government, mm -hmm. uh, presuming that the school is government funded or presuming that the school is you know actually part of the government. Yeah, those are. Um, are but even racially explicit classifications can sometimes survive. Right. We know that because we have the affirmative action cases. And so that is saying the following. There is no such thing as an absolute right in this country. Yeah. No such. Thing. The first people who say the Second Amendment says um, shall not be infringed. Second Amendment does say shall not be infringed. Mm -hmm. uh, first Amendment does say Congress shall uh, make no make no law abridging the freedom of speech. But it oh, doesn't mean I just want to real quick because I was citing a lot that. Um... I was citing a lot about the historical precedent for like where laws come from. Um, somebody, or well, because, um, um, oh my God, oh, because Alito was bringing it up. Um, somebody brought up that even if there was historical precedent for things, that um, that doesn't necessarily, oh fuck, well, I'm trying to remember what the argument was. That like, oh, even if it was the case that a law was constructed for a stupid reason that no longer applies today, you wouldn't overturn it because if that was the case, then things like the like the Second Amendment might get overturned because historically, if this was something to protect us from tyranny, like realistically today, that right exists isn't really used in the same way. But you wouldn't go back and flip that just because the mm -hmm. arguments have changed or something. It was an interesting yeah. point. But yeah, right. that's that's come up multiple times in the context of this uh, case known as Crawford. Mm -hmm. um, there's a constitutional right in this country to. Um, to have people who are testifying against you um, available in front of you to be pre confronted with your, it's called Accuser. a confrontation. Yeah. Yeah. Confronted with your witnesses. And for the longest time, the Supreme Court had said, you know, you don't really need to confront your witnesses. So long as you have, you can have hearsay, but it has to just be reliable hearsay. Okay. Um, you know, developments in the law, whatever, you know? Uh, and But people like Scalia will say, no, that's what it meant at the time. And just because now, are, you know, you could conceive of different rationales doesn't mean that you should necessarily get rid of it. That I would say that's more of like a values thing on your judicial and mm -hmm. interpretive philosophy, I suppose. Sure. Okay. Um, but it's a good point to bring up. Uh, back to strict scrutiny. Okay. That has typically, you know, this is the, the most searching inquiry. Um, now, when you're in the strict scrutiny world, that's when you are entangling in, in, in a fundamental right. That's when you're making a classification base that, that's su suspect. Mm -hmm. In the context of equal protection, that's going to be racial-based classifications, uh, national origin-based classifications, um, whether or not you're a citizen for state governments. The, mm -hmm. the, keep in mind, the federal government's able to classify and uh, discriminate uh, non-citizens, but state governments are presumed that that's a suspect classification because you know the federal government has the power to to do immigration and all that stuff. Okay. Um, th those kinds of classifications are ethnic classifications. Um, and also fundamental rights, as I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. um, so classifications, or sorry, laws that might infringe, um, let's see, a, a law that is content non-neutral or viewpoint non-neutral in the domain of First Amendment law, mm -hmm. free speech stuff. That's going to be a, a very high level heightened scrutiny, uh, maybe even strict scrutiny. Um, th those kinds of fundamental rights get treated um, a lot harsher it doesn't mean you can't overcome that kind of stuff sure. you can overcome uh if, if you have a good enough reason if it's a compelling reason that's these are national security yeah you can this overcome is, literally anything because I, I think somebody yeah. like the first amendment is thought of as like the most important one but like freedom of speech isn't even absolute like all of these rights are contingent on other yeah. things yeah for different reasons right mm -hmm. one reason for the first amendment stuff is well this is not even speech that that could be a reason so think you know if, if i say driving my car into someone that's speech mm -hmm. you could be like well no that's that's not speech so you, you could have an argument about whether something is speech but even assuming that something is speech um the, the government might have an extremely good reason to make it an unprotected category of speech sure. or might have a really good reason for why viewpoint discrimination in this case is you know is, is really important mm -hmm. but, but <sighs> Yeah, so so the, the tiers of scrutiny I think is a worthwhile analysis, and it gets you in the sort of frame of thinking that, um, and and he's right or they are right. I don't know if, what their gender is, when they say that the fundamental rights aspect does not perfectly line up to the equal protection context and the tiers of scrutiny stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I believe it is the case that the equal protection kind of approach came first, and then the fundamental rights stuff kind of got mapped onto it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the fundamental rights stuff is there's. Uh, problems related to mapping that out perfectly. Um, mm -hmm. First Amendment doctrine, for instance, 
does not map perfectly onto strict scrutiny analysis. You'll have different, uh, you, for time, place, and manner restrictions with speech, it'll be a different rule. Um, for speech in, in schools, it's a different rule than uh, strict scrutiny and, and a bunch of different rules with respect to incitement. They're kind of sui generis, or is that is that the, the term? I don't know, the term meaning unique. Okay. Um, and so that's true, but it's kind of the way we look at fundamental rights is first identify the right and then identify this, the, the state's interest. Uh -huh. And so that's why I was trying to get us um, in the mode of analyzing whether or not you even agree that there's a fundamental right to abortion. What Alito is doing in his opinion is he's not doing what you were doing. In, in the argument you were focused on, well, the state's interest here is obviously different between, as between a, um, a fertilized egg versus sperm. And I'm not gonna deny you there's not like some factual difference that is maybe even significant. Uh, there, I'm not going to deny that to you. you know? uh -huh. A sperm is different than a fertilized egg. But you were kind of looking at it from, well, of course the state has a bigger interest in something that's closer in time to being born. Um, but that's not what Alito's doing. Alito is denying that there is even a fundamental right to abortion at, at the rights analysis before you get into the state interest analysis. And he's using um, phrases in Roe and Casey and acknowledgments by the court in those areas about quote unquote potential life, which is in the context of Roe and Casey uh -huh. discussing the state's interest as you were, as one naturally would. When you're thinking about potential life and that kind of stuff, you're thinking about state's interest. Um, and he's not doing a thorough analysis of distinguishing um, abortion from these other, from concept, from contraception and all that stuff. Sure. And so my goal, Destiny, was to make you look stupid. My goal was to make you look stupid by either getting you to deny that there are implied rights, which you smartly did not. You did not deny that there were implied rights. At the beginning of our conversation, we agreed that there were implied rights. But if you don't agree that there are implied rights, you're, I'm going to start giving you a hype Yeah, mode. there's like a million yeah. different things, like interracial yeah. marriage contraception, the easy yes. ones that people bring up, of course, fall yeah. immediately. Yeah. So you're, if someone denies that there are implied rights, I just throw a bunch of hypotheticals at you that make you look insane. Sure. And but then if they're like a hardcore conservative originalist, they'll, they'll, they'll probably, the yeah, they'll bite the bullet on all of it. Say, yeah, I think that but, it should be up to the state to decide if sodomy is legal or not, right? Yeah. They'll bite the bullet and they'll say, the more ridiculous the hypo you give me, the less likely it is to occur. Sure. Or right? that. Okay, sure. Um, but, uh, you know, then I'll say, like, are you crazy? Have you looked at these laws? And if they're really like a conservative, 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 you give them the vaccine example and you say, um, does the state have the right to mandate uh, vaccine and the the punishment for not getting the vaccine is a death penalty sure. and you get them and they would right? have to say they would have to agree well in the constitution your right to not be vaccinated yeah. isn't specifically enumerated so fine Correct. states can make rulings based on that sure yeah so like and you can get people to buy, but but usually what you get is someone's like okay there are some implied rights and yeah, but so as soon what, as they've opened the can of worms on that then you need a qualifying right. basis for it and then now you there, need you're... to distinguish why is abortion, not one of them. Uh -huh. Now you can move the burden to me. And that's what I think you should have, uh, you try to do multiple times. And I was kind of, I was a little bit shifty, right? Um, you were like, wait, why you should be, you should be the one telling me why abortion is a fundamental right. Why am I in the position of having to distinguish contraception? Shouldn't you have the task? Sure. Because of, if it's not enumerated, you need to tell me where the right is coming from. Like how, right. are you, how is it, what does it imply? So I didn't really explain from? that well, sure. um, but, I'll, but I'll do so now. The, the idea is pre row, there were a bunch of cases that were establishing the kinds of fundamental rights that um, the court was willing to hear on and was willing to grant. And it wasn't doing it in the kind of, for the reason that we're doing it in row. A, a lot of these earlier cases are either like equal protection cases. The, the, the case I cited to you, Skinner, that's the sterilization case. By the way, that sterilization case did not overrule a previous case, I think it's called Buck versus Bell, um, where it, which it seemed to be like sterilization is okay, guys, but we've come to understand that um, nowadays, sterilization probably wouldn't be upheld by the court. Um, but, you know, the, the cases that, I, that were before Roe were kind of like equal protection cases or they're, they're citing other aspects of the Constitution, like the Ninth Amendment or the penumbras of the First, Second, sure. or sorry, First, Third, Fourth Amendments, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason why I think abortion falls in line is because the key cases like Griswold um, and Eisenstadt and uh, that's another contraception case. Mm -hmm. And Skinner, they all kind of had to do with these like intimate decisions about whether to bear or beget a child. That was, that's kind of like, 
the core of what's at issue in those cases is that the uh, now you could say Griswold is more about the privacy of the home, uh, the marital home. Mm -hmm. You could construe those cases that way, but it doesn't quite fall in line with Eisenstadt, which isn't really about uh, the marital home because they're not married. You know. Well, um, my understanding is that that um, the non-marital home, the marital home, was the big argument, and then the non-marital home was basically just an invoking of the Fourteenth Amendment's uh, equal protections. That's how. That's the the only way that they made that jump. That's my understanding of it. People had different opinions on, at the time. Yeah, yes, okay, gotcha. a lot of these were equal protection cases, mm -hmm. um, but it, it, the the court was making it didn't seem that equal protection analysis should get you there, right? Because typically, when you're, when you're doing equal protection analysis, like why wouldn't it? I mean, is married a suspect class? Is unmarried a suspect class? Like, well, I think they're not, so. I thought originally it was. Um, I'd have to go back and read, but basically, like the mar the marital one had to do with the idea that like like having sex in your home and using contraception, like the idea that the government would ever intervene in any way there between a married couple couple was ridiculous. And then when a later court case came up um, to provide like like why are married couples the only ones protected here and not unmarried couples? That that equal protections was the only reason why it was extended to basically everybody. Was my understanding uh, right? But the but the logic of, the, of like the privacy of one's home. Mm -hmm. It, it, that's where I got you with the bestiality one, right? If if you bite that bullet, that the government has no right to intrude you there, or if, if that's your rationale, and this is the problem with that being the rationale, is why <laughs> the intrusion into the government, uh, into the, you know, the home of someone, would that be any greater or lesser if it's bestiality? And well, the reason is, I, it, is it like I, federally illegal to have bestiality? Is that a federally legal thing? Has a court ruled on that? Well, be careful here as well, because yeah. you just asked if it's federally legal, um, and I want to get this crystal clear. And you, you, there was kind of this uh, discussion you, where you were doubting me on the police power stuff, which which makes sense because this is not like because you're not a lawyer, you're a really smart guy. But um, it, it's no, a lot of, of this stuff is like you just have to learn the process. Like, you know, no matter yeah, how smart you are, you're not, you're not gonna have any fucking idea what like correct. substantive due process is. You don't fucking read through yes, shit. Yeah, correct. Yeah, I understand so that. Yeah. There's two questions when you're analyzing like an is it constitutional mm -hmm. thing kind of two questions you could look at. Mm -hmm. One is, is this a, a powers question? Does the government entity in question have the power to do that? Mm -hmm. That's typically in the context of federal law or federal enactments. Mm -hmm. um, in the Obamacare litigation, the question wasn't, does the Affordable Care Act violate some individual right? The question was, does Congress even have the power under the Commerce Clause or the Taxing Authority to enact this legislation? Commer you know, Congress is a government of limited powers, and so typically we don't think of them as having um, the quote unquote general police power that states do. Yeah. Uh, now states are limited by their own state constitution. Mm -hmm. But the reason why all my examples are state because I don't want to get into a federal powers question where we're wondering whether or not the, the Congress even has the authority under the Commerce Clause and all that stuff to do the enactment. Mm -hmm. I want to avoid that question and avoid like the, um, for instance, like the drug war. Um, you could think of it in two ways. One is where does Congress get the authority to regulate drugs? It doesn't say in the constitution that it has the, the authority to regulate drugs. Another one could be like, well, drugs is an individual right. My ability to ingest drugs is my right. And so that's a powers question and a rights question. Sure. And so when you just now said like, well, where does Congress have the, have the authority to regulate bestiality? Um, you could say something, if you wanted to stick it in Congress or wanted to stick it with you know the federal government, you could have like, it shall be illegal to commit bestiality in interstate commerce, right? And that could kind of save you. Um, but you avoid that question entirely by just, because we know that the Bill of Rights are largely um, applied as to the states to the incorporation doctrine through the 14th Amendment. Mm -hmm. um, we can skip that question by just saying it's a state government. And does the state government have the authority to um, prohibit bestiality yeah, yeah. In, your, in your home? And the reason why I was going there with you is because under the rationale of Griswold where it's the marital home, it kind of seems like why should they, right? And you said like, it, it, that's why your logic led you there, right? Because, well, no, I mean, if, if, if they can't stop me from having sex with a with my partner in my home, why should they be able to stop me having sex with a with a goat in my room? Mm -hmm. um, that's why that logic from Griswold isn't super strong, because we all think the government should be able to like do stuff in your home. Like, well, we but there has to be, I don't know, fuck, I'd have to go back and read this. I don't know if it, what part of the basis it would be, or that means end fit, but like, I imagine for stuff like bestiality or whatever, the arguments would be in favor of like, 
public health or something, right? Like I imagine I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure there are probably certain states that I can leave my house in that the that a city can like arrest me for. Like if I was to start like growing like dangerous plants or like tons of mold mm -hmm. or fungus or breeding diseases in my house, I'm pretty sure like a city government can come in and like just take my shit from me. Yeah, so but the only like a public health yeah. interest there or something, right? But yeah, go. Correct. The only problem with that aspect is with strict scrutiny or the heightened scrutiny, we really like you need a really, really good reason. Mm -hmm. And the policy arguments you were given seem to suggest that there's like not a good reason, right? You what you said was something like, well, we kill animals and we enslave them. So like, why should we have a problem if you have sex with with animals? Base. That would seem to like undermine the notion that there's a strong governmental interest in preventing it if we're already allowing for hunting and, and destruction of animals and slavery of animals. Um, and so that's kind of, that's why saying something is a fundamental right, that's like a huge deal. That's like, okay, now the burden is on the government to, to like make a strong showing, a mm -hmm. strong, strong, strong showing with evidence that what they're doing is at like advancing some absolutely needed purpose. And this is the most narrow way to do it. Sure. It's the least restrictive means of getting there. Um, and when you, so that's, that's why that Griswold rationale seems absurd to people because people like, um, Scalia and Alito, they don't agree that it's a fundamental right to have sex with a goat or a fundamental right to have bestiality. Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to put you on different ground than them and to show you that what's really motivating Griswold and these other cases is not the privacy of the marital home. And that's why the court abandons it, that kind of rationale. And they go towards privacy as one option. Another one in case you see more of is the bodily autonomy rationale, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, the abortion right, I think, falls in line with what they said in Eisenstadt of the, you know, the fundamental choice of people to decide for themselves whether to bear or beget a child. Mm -hmm. And that's why the abortion and the rights analysis part of me, a, a part of this, I think it seems so strong because it's really, really hard at the right stage of the analysis for me to distinguish contraception. Think about this also, uh, something that I did not bring up, but I should have. So much contraception happens after fertilization. Yeah, theoretically, depending on the type, you get, like I'm, I'm almost positive that plan B is an abortion, I think. Um, it somehow gets you to eject like the fertilized egg, even if it's like implanted or whatever, I think. Um, yeah. And I don't know there are some forms Even I think of, birth control does Yeah, technically, if you're on the pill, if you come in the person at the right time, the, that egg can still get fertilized on the way out. <laughs> yeah. um, so technically, yeah. Um, yeah so I think well, always one of the silliest arguments about people who think that like, um, if you truly believe that like aborting a fetus that's like two weeks old or whatever is like murder. Like you're, you're the most compelling thing you should be working on in life uh, is women getting pregnant because there's literally like a genocide every single day of accidental miscarriages and shit. And it seems yeah. strange for somebody to pretend that they care so much about it, but not address that at all, you know, yeah. So the, the, the line between contraception and abortion, if your definition of abortion is um, killing a fertilized egg, it would seem like an IUD is an, is an abortion. Depending like, on how, yeah, I think. But yeah. yeah, and several forms of contraception are abortions. But that's why also why I pushed you on the fertilized egg, you know, the frozen fertilized egg um, situation, which, by the way, I think that it, you, you absolutely can freeze fertilized egg. Yeah, um, actually, somebody emailed me the whole process for that. For in vitro yeah. fertilization, I think they're almost always exclusively freezing fertilized eggs. And then they the, test them yeah. after some a, a little bit of development to see which ones are most likely to be healthy or whatever. So that is the case, yeah. Yeah, the, the reason why I push there is because I don't think that destruction of fertilized egg is a lot of people's definitions of abortion. I think people's definition is like ending a pregnancy. And Maybe, you, I will say, um, I know you're a little younger. I'm 33, I don't know if you remember this. I don't remember what time period it was. Oh, wait, okay. Wait, you said you're 27? 26. Oh, 26, okay. Do you remember stem cell stuff? Yeah, of course. Okay, that was a really, really big talking point for conservatives. Um, yeah. Stem cell I, research I, was like one of the biggest fucking things that they talked about when it came to abortion. So it wouldn't surprise me if they attacked some forms of contraception afterwards. That wouldn't surprise yeah, me. Yeah, I, I, in, in the talk that we had, it sounds like I'm denying that that is a thing. I just want to be clear. I do not dispute that conservative groups have been against stem cell research for the longest time. Mm -hmm. I have a friend who has muscular dystrophy mm -hmm. yeah. and who are like really, really wants um, more stem cell research to be done. Mm -hmm. um, and we would talk about it all the time in like high school and growing up and stuff. And um, so, he, and he was always like, I, it's so fucked up to me that conservatives like don't want to um, 
fund this stuff that could save, you know, could help me live more, more time, you know? Um, so I do not doubt that that's the case. I just think that it leads you many weird places if you accept that that's the case. If you accept that that's the case, then really what you're saying is someone who was never pregnant could be having tons of abortions. The, the example is, let's say that you um, take out a bunch of eggs and you fertilize them, um, you freeze them, you would agree that that person was never pregnant, right? Never um, pregnant. Yeah, okay, yeah. So someone who's never pregnant could have abortions? Mm -hmm. Like that to me seems super, super weird. And we're, we're kind of off field of legal conversation, but just to... to yeah, there's gonna, the everything weird. around abortion is going to seem super weird because it's it's a very weird question. Like we're really testing like the boundaries of what the fuck human life is, Correct. which we, none of yeah. us really have a good definition. Of the reason why I'm bringing this up only, mm -hmm. Destiny, is to say the the line between contraception and abortion is very thin, and so your rationale at the right stage for distinguishing between the two ought to be really really good. Because if you accept, you don't have to accept. You don't have to accept Griswold. Mm -hmm. You don't have to accept uh, the sterilization cases. You can deny those cases. You can deny all that stuff. But if you are accepting those cases, and um, Alito, by the way, I don't think it's a foregone conclusion that he accepts those cases. He says that those cases are different. Well, it feels like different. it would, doesn't it? Uh, unless you are literally, I'm not calling you a conspiracy theorist, but like, wouldn't we have to accept that Alito is just like bold face lying then, if that is the no. case? Because he, no, doesn't he, because doesn't there's like four different times I think in that draft that he says that these are fundamentally different. He says that this ruling does not, should not be taken as affecting those rulings. No, I th no, he he goes a step farther, right? And he says that these are fundamentally different types of. Well, things. he says, yeah, no, no, no. Uh -huh. You can agree that they're different, and oh, but they could can still be different and wrong. Honest, they could both be different and wrong, right? Sure, I guess and, that's possible. Yeah, and. Um, that's why we think I think it's shifty because his historical analysis, which we didn't spend a lot of time talking about, mm -hmm. but what I wanted to drive home and what where I should have driven home was that as applied to the other stuff, to the private sex acts, mm -hmm. so, certainly the sodomy acts, to if I accept your um, abortion, oh sorry, not abortion, your bestiality, probably right, which I hope that you walk away from at some point, or well, at least I don't, I don't think so. But that's like a moral thing, unless it's like a legal thing. Or no, 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 one thing is the policy, that you totally think that animals are not deserving of rights, and that, you know, it's so absurd to you that people are okay with eating them on mass and not raping them on mass. I can accept that as sort of your philosophical, moralistic look. The, the thing that's ridiculous and why I was laughing, why I was dumbfounded was not the policy rationale that you gave. Mm -hmm. It was the constitutional reasoning. How can we think, how can we say it's such a stretch that abortion um, can't be read into the Constitution, but a right to bestiality as a matter of constitutional law can be? That's the not the policy rationale. The fact that people seem so bewildered, or you seem so bewildered at first, at an abortion right being implied, but you weren't as bewildered for a bestiality right being implied. Yeah, I guess and, just because the abortion thing it just feels so much fundamentally different but I've, I've, we're gonna loop on that obviously but yeah I understand what yeah you're saying. understood yeah um so so th that's kind of why w the historical analysis aspect mm -hmm. to it would i think totally crush so many of these substantive due process um child rearing cases or you know decisions of whether to bear or beget a child decisions mm -hmm. um because and also like marriage stuff no one thought in sex stuff you know one thought that at the founding, there was like this affirmative right to have sex with, you know, have gay sex in your room. Yeah, no sure. one thought of that, you know, that there was, if, if you think about these rights extremely narrowly, as Alito does, he doesn't think of, of abortion right as the decision of whether to bear or beget a child. He thinks of abortion right as abortion. He, he thinks of the right uh, in dissent, Scalia isn't denying that marriage isn't a fundamental right. He says that, you know, heterosexual marriage, I don't know that he says that, but my intuition would be that heterosexual marriage is a fundamental right. Sure. And that changing the definition, we're changing the definition of marriage by including gay people there. Mm -hmm. um, so how you view these rights, either narrowly or expansively, really, really matters. Um, but accepting Alito's framing, uh, there, there's some idiot, uh, I don't want to say idiot. I wanna be <laughs> yeah, go ahead. There's some, re and I usually don't, <laughs> involve myself i've never commented on a reddit thread before this week there's some guy or girl i don't know quid pro joe if you're out there 
I, I try to send a message to you to have a have a chat at some point. Oh shit! Wait, was this on one of the Reddit threads about you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was gonna say something because some people were thinking, was this about how people were trying to say that you're trying to say that contraception or jerking off is the same thing as a fetus or whatever? No, that's well, one is I'm not. That's not what I'm I'm doing. Yeah, and you're two, trying to say that like the court making the the point you're yes. were making was that like the court making any statement whatsoever about abortion necessarily is them taking a position on something related to it, that that's unavoidable. Like, yeah, I, I understood what you meant there. Um, when I was arguing against you, I don't know if you think I think this, but when I was arguing against you, I was just saying that like, it does seem to be the case that there's a reason to be these things differently. I wasn't trying to say, or I probably came off that way, but I wasn't trying to say that I don't think that you think they're the same thing. Um, yeah. Because if you were that stupid, I wouldn't I talk to you. I don't think they're the <laughs> Yeah. I don't they're not the same thing, mm -hmm. but, but they're close they're, enough that like if the court is taking a position on one They're probably yes. Yeah, have just have a reason to them. Mm -hmm. um, and but, but but what really got to me was quite pro Joe um, <laughs> Was so bewildered that This will of course Alito's opinion is not gonna affect any other right like you can't think just because the court says in dicta Oh, mm -hmm. by the way, this ruling doesn't affect those other cases. Literally, he's correct that the ruling doesn't, wouldn't, it's a draft ruling, mm -hmm. but the, the draft opinion literally would not be holding precedent that would overturn these rights. Mm -hmm. You have to be a grade A moron to not see the logical conclusion that one would draw from the reasoning of the opinion. Mm -hmm. If you read Alito's opinion and you see the rationale, that's why all these lawyers that you're like mad about on Twitter are up in arms, not because they're stupid, but because they read words, they read reasoning, and they read rationales, and they say, okay, if you apply this historical rationale, Obergefell falls tomorrow, you know? And maybe even contraception falls tomorrow. And just because he's saying in dicta that it technically, our holding does not affect those other holdings, doesn't mean that he would not overrule those other rights given the opportunity that you don't have a five votes to do so uh, wherever they come up. Sure. Um, so, so you're sa essentially saying that like he's saying that he's leaving these alone for now. But if we are to expect him to maintain yeah. a consistent like theoretical judicial framework or whatever, then which we would expect the Supreme Court justice to do so, then should these cases come up in the future, similar rationale could be used to get rid of them. Sure. A hundred percent. And and that to, to be bewildered by that and be like, it's such a stretch that Pisco would say that these other rights could be in danger mm -hmm. you're just not serious you're, you're you're just not reading the opinion in a in a in a serious way sure to, to maybe like a more charitable or uh i don't want to say intellectually honest maybe a better way to frame it is that like the framework through which you arrive at this decision could theoretically be used to arrive at other decisions right correct correct sure. that that framework and and remember where alito was in those cases the ones he wasn't around for griswold um but he he was around for obergefell um, I don't know if he was around. I don't think he was around for Lawrence, but um, in many of these cases, or certainly his perspective has been one of um, scrutiny towards this line of cases. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, I think that if you if you doubt that, if you're doubting that this opinion could be used to affect other rights, mm -hmm. just look around you. Look at what the state legislatures are doing. They're responding rationally to this uh, draft opinion, mm -hmm. and they're going after other rights because it makes sense to, given this opinion. Um, and, and no one is being put at ease by this opinion and being like, oh, don't worry, those other rights are safe, thank God. Anyone, <laughs> no one should be thinking that because, and no one is thinking that because it's not rational to think that. Um, so, so yeah, that's that's kind of my, my take on, on the, the logic of Alito's draft opinion and where, where it would lead you, you know? Gotcha. Okay, well, good luck. You're going to be debating this in the arena, okay? What's up with that? Is he, so are we, are we getting a conservative person? Well, I want the, that one guy in chat. I read out his paragraph settings. The one dude is against Roe and Casey. Um, Jerry, or I think the guy that I just dragged in? Fuck. Um, and then I think the other guy has a somewhat nuanced opinion about it. And then uh, I wanted to get the Nick Rakita guy. What's up with him? Yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah. He's like oh, yeah. one of the biggest like law law people on YouTube. Oh, is he? Oh, he was in my DMs where my I, he said he would, but I'm trying to okay the time with him. Um, uh, yeah, to basically discuss it. And he's uh, he's in favor of Alito's ruling, so it would be interesting. I mean, that's even a harder position to take because if you accept Alito's ruling, then you're accepting potentially um, a lot of baggage. Yeah, but remember, if he's a conservative, he might, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean. Yeah, that's 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 true. Um, God damn! I mean, I really hope that he would join. 
I, I think that yeah, I think it'll be, be fun. Awesome. I like the legal arguments are interesting um, to have a better understanding of like the process at work and everything that's going on. Because uh, I think it is really hard to understand, how, like, because I think um, if you believe I'm a reasonably intelligent person, which I think I am, uh, it basically feels like the Constitution basically says that like these are the things the government's allowed to do, and then if it's not specified in there, then we get that right. And um, I don't know if everybody's education is like this. Um, we never talk about like state powers ever in school. <laughs> like it's t completely unaddressed. Um, yeah. Like it's embarrassing to admit, but I think I was like 32 literally years old before I realized that there are like not very many federal crimes um, or, or like when I think of things like murder and rape these are like obviously like federal crimes they're not like most of the shit that people talk about are, are like state crimes um, and that was even after yeah. learning that like when you talk about like federal prisons are like the worst ever I think it's like isn't it like 10% or 9% of our whole prison population are yeah, federal it's yeah. a small percentage of total mm -hmm. yeah 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 um, so by the way, there are federal murder laws but typically they're like in the United States special maritime jurisdiction sure. or an interstate or when you know you know you're i don't know assass if you do some act of terrorism or something like mm -hmm. that uh yeah or if I'm you're sure like on federal property or something like that or dc mm -hmm. um one thing to to realize destiny is we will often get an act if you accept the implied rights mm -hmm. you have to have an answer for what is your limiting principle sure because you're gonna get questions like well then shouldn't bestiality be an individual right shouldn't um basically you know <laughs> Should an unconsensual, uh, unconsensual sex be a fundamental right? Mm -hmm. Shouldn't drugs be a fundamental right? And, and you need to have a reason, like a way to get about um, distinguishing what is an implied fundamental right and what is not. Mm -hmm. And I don't disagree that history is the guide point here. It is history. Um, and in the past, in the early 20th century, there's a line of cases known as Lochner, uh, that, that, that where the court said that there's Sorry, there was a case called Lochner and a bunch of other cases that uh, came from it mm -hmm. where the court was striking down like economic regulation, mm -hmm. like workplace laws that said there's a limit on how many hours you can work. There's a limit. This is like a libertarian's dream, wet dream, that, mm -hmm. that, the, state, that the, the courts were striking down laws from the government, putting limits on how people could contract. Mm -hmm. And everyone recognizes, except for, I guess, Ayn Rand people and libertarians, that that line of cases was was stupid and silly. That there isn't a fundamental right to contract in the United States, and uh, eventually the court turned away from the Lochner era view of economic liberty as this fundamental right. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I feel like a lot of the per like the the personal liberty cases will not cite substantive due process, which Lochner used mm -hmm. because of this this the specter of the economic rights cases. Um, the problem is distinguishing Lochner. And the way you do that is is looking at history and, and, and really um, noting that it's not this free form inquiry um, and, try, and really trying to distinguish what is essential to our ordered liberty and what is not essential to our ordered liberty. And obviously reasonable minds can disagree about that. Yeah. But I feel like precedent is our guiding light. And um, based on every, all the cases that happened pre row I think Roe is right in line with all those other cases. Um, and certainly, with we didn't really even talk about today, with all the stare decisis factors, mm -hmm. to me it's an open and shut case. It would, it's appalling that the court is considering overturning it. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, I'll I'll leave you alone for now. Um, oh no, wait, this actually isn't what I wanted to talk to you about. Oh, what'd you want to talk to I told about? you to come in. Um, okay. You recommended me a movie before I left. Do you remember what movie you recommended? Oh fuck. No, I don't. I think you. I think you were the one that recommended that everything, everywhere, all at once. No, no, no. Did you not recommend it? Wait, what movie did you recommend me to watch? I didn't recommend any movie. Am I crazy? I thought he did before he left. You should see this. Was I talking to somebody else and he, and they recommended it? Why did you hate the movie? Or did you love it? Should I take credit? Have you seen it? No. Oh fuck! It definitely wasn't you. Oh shit! Who was it? Oh well. Good thing we had the legal talk then. <laughs> Wait, that's what you're gonna bring me on to talk about? Yeah, fuck. Somebody, maybe it was the music guy. Oh, okay. Listen, okay? Yeah. You need to see that movie today, okay? Everything <laughs> Everywhere? What's it called? Everything Everywhere All at Once. Everything. Got leave. Leave and go. You need, there's a theater playing it right now near you, okay? Oh, it's a theater? It's like a. Yeah, it's, it's in, in the, the movie, theater? okay? <laughs> okay, bro. Thank you for, for, for chatting with me anyway. I appreciate it. And I really hope that you're able to get Nick Rikita. Mm hmm. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've already like hyped up my peeps. Uh -oh. I have peeps, by the way. Your peeps, I noticed. 
I, I have peeps. Oh yeah, because I think uh, didn't you ask me like, can I hype my peeps up for this or whatever? I think you said that. Yeah. Yeah, you're a very interesting uh, DMer. I saw that. Um, uh -oh. Who was it who did like an entire manifesto on the way you asked them a question? I forget. It might have been. Oh, was it BX Bullet? <laughs> Yeah, so I'm not gonna spam caps at people, you know. I just it's just what we do. But sometimes people get really mad about it. Like, are you screaming at me? It's like, no, I just sometimes I just type like, you know, I just do this shit. What? Yeah. Um. But but yeah. Anyway. Uh. Hopefully that'll that'll happen. And um. Appreciate you having me on. Yeah. Okay. Have fun. Be careful, bud. All right. Later.